Um, all right, yeah, um, thanks for all coming today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, interesting vulnerability in the back door I found on a very once popular uh, brand of Chinese commercial routers. Um, so uh, yeah, let's just get started. <coughs> all right, so the, the way this started is um, it was just after a, a little while after I started working at Tenable on the, um, their zero day research team. And we were doing a bit of like a consumer grade router roundup, you know, just getting a bunch of routers like hauled off Amazon or Walmart or wherever. And then just, uh, you know, doing what we do, um, looking for vulnerabilities and so on. And the Wavelink AC1200 uh, just, uh, just, you know, arrived by mail one day. It looks a lot like this guy right here. Um, so, you know, I set it up, I plugged it in, I go to like the landing page IP. There's nothing there. I kind of, you know, ping around a little bit. Look at like, oh, okay, it's on a different address than it said it was going to be. So I go there and see what I see, and I see this. In fact, what I see is like right here. So that's weird. You know, I mean, this says FICOM. It's all in Chinese. Um, it doesn't seem to be a wavelength router at all. And I kind of looked around. This apparently was not the only person this happened to. Um, we have this angry review on Amazon there where someone seems to have had the same experience. Quite suspicious, they say. And, you know, kinda. So now I'm really curious. So uh, I don't even know where to find it. I mean, I'd never heard of FICOM before, so I'm like, oh, I should really just take this chance to dig in, see what I find. This is kind of neat. It's always nice to get surprises. So, you know, I, I searched on like Google and then Baidu, um, and the uh, search for the FICOM K2GA1, which is the, you know, what it identifies itself as, once you log in, um, brought up listings for this familiar looking device, um, spitting image, really, of the Wavelink AC1200. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, it turns out this is identical hardware, and there's sort of an interesting story of how one became the other, which I'll, I'll broach it at the end of the talk. I'll kind of leave it as like uh, hanging as a mystery for now. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the same router, but with different firmware. Um, although this did have, I tore the lid off it and I don't remember what I did with it, but it used to say Wavelink, but FICOM on the inside. So introducing the FICOM K2GA1. Let's see what we can find in this thing. <coughs> um, if you go, you know, you log in, you like set it up. I was using like, a lot of like Google Translate, a lot with like a little phone, you know, scanner and so on. And uh, I fumbled my way through it. I don't read any Chinese, so I apologize in advance for any translation errors in this talk. Um, and uh, you know, I got to, to the system status page. Where I take this to be. It identifies the device. The the model is K2G uh, hardware version A1. It's running firmware version 22.6.3.20, and it's a fairly ordinary, like you know. Um, router uh, HTTP interface that you see here. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to kind of take a uh, deeper dive. Uh, so I started looking around, seeing if there were any known vulnerabilities to this. Maybe there'd be something unpatched. Um, since, uh, yeah, you know, m maybe I'd find something there. And um, on some like Chinese router hacking forums, I did find, you know, thanks to Google Translate, uh, some documentation on a pretty simple post auth command injection volume to get shell access. Great, you know, <coughs> that's you find these things everywhere, and it was nice to find one here. Uh, for this one, um, this was thanks to upantool.com. I forget the original author. I have to dig that up. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, it's just like a little command injection when you're setting the the update time for the automatic firmware updates. Um, nothing too special there, but there's a, what it's showing here is a command that just starts the telnet daemon so you can log in, poke around. Um, and, you know, I set it to like just some high port so it wouldn't interfere with whatever else I wanted to find or start there. Um, and boom, got a shell, cool. You know, now I'm in, now I can look around. And a post auth command injection is only really like so interesting. It would be really nice if I could find some way to like, you know, crack this pre auth um, or WAN side or something a little bit more, you know bit more meat on it, um, and something that was mine, you know? So uh, first things first there, I just took a look at what services were running, and I saw something that kind of caught my interest here, um, which is what most of the rest of this talk is going to be about. Um, right here, can you see my little mouse pointer? I should do a big flashy one. 
Oh, no, look, I put an arrow on there. I was, yeah, I thought ahead. Um, yeah, we have this demon called Telnet D Startup. Um, you see this sort of thing sometimes on routers. It's a way of providing a kind of service backdoor for either the, you know, maintenance or law enforcement just to, like, gain shell access on the router. Um, and sometimes these things are just gaping open. Um, actually, if you look at what were uh, the Wavelink routers that replace these, you know, the ones that had the proper firmware have a very easy to enter backdoor. There's not really much of a challenge there. You just have to guess the, you know, the secret URL. Um, but so I'm like, okay, well, let, it'd be nice to like document this. I figured it'd be something fairly simple. Maybe you send like a magic packet, you log in or whatever. Netgear has one like that. Didn't seem entirely foreign, but uh, yeah, so running on UDP port 21210. And some first impressions. Um, you know, like this router in general, we were looking at a 32-bit MIPS little Endian elf binary, uh, just running as a daemon with root permissions. Um, the operating system is a fork of OpenWRT. Um, and this thing listens just completely quietly on port 21210. Um, so that, you know, if you hit it, like Nmap will report it as just sort of, you know, open or filtered. It doesn't return any data unless you know how to knock on it. Um, so, you know, it's fairly discreet, really. And, um, you know, first thing I do when I get a binary, of course, I take a look at the string dump. And um, here's a curated list of interesting strings in this binary just to get started. Um, we've got, well, I mean, this looks neat here. I mean, this uh, looks like it is, uh, is an RSA key. Um, probably, you'd assume like a, a public key or what have you. Um, and just in, in hex, about the right size for that, and especially when we see RSA public encrypt and decrypt. And this itself is kind of a funny pair that we have just public encrypt and public decrypt. Um, you know, normally you encrypt with a public key, you decrypt with a private key. There's some uses for doing the reverse, like for um, signatures and so on. Um, but you know, that, that will become significant. Um, we have a couple shell commands. Um, one launches Telnet, just as you'd expect from Telnet D startup. The other one is, um, j it just writes to the EEPROM memory, and um, I'll show you what that does in a minute. We also have this. A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, three, four. This will be significant too. So, um, you know, let's take a look at it in Ghidra now. So, if uh, you, the main loop of this, uh, of this service, um, it listens on a socket, it transitions between several states, and, you know, there's a whole um, kind of expected protocol that you have to interact with it through um, in order to get it to launch Telnet. And so, Here's what we're looking at. We begin in, this is the state variable, and I'll show you the labeled version in a minute. It was stripped when I got it. Um, we begin in state two, which is itself kind of interesting. It's just some enum, but it's, you know, kind of curious that you choose the number two to represent your initial state, but, you know, whatever, we move along. Um, then we go to state zero. Then we go to state one. And what do we have to do to transition from one state to another? Um, we'll see that. Oh, and then state uh, one, it's, this just sort of has a go-to and a fairly trivial check. So we'll look at the code that it goes to. This is the rest of state one. Here, um, it compares the user input to a couple variables here. And then depending on, you know, if it likes what it sees, it will either execute one of these two shell commands. So, you know, I think I kind of know what I'm looking at so far here. Um, if the EEPROM flag is written, then you know, this, uh, then when um, start Telnet D startup uh, just, you know, starts up, um, it checks that EEPROM, if it's running, it uh, just throws open the, the Telnet service as well. And this is a way that you can preserve Telnet access across uh, reboots. So let's go through this state by state, because I think, I, I figure like if there's ever a place where I can really get into the weeds, you know, this is probably it. So. Uh, Let's do some reversing here. We're going to go into state two, the initial state when we're interacting with this thing. Um, all right, so here we go. This is sort of the, the main block. Um, and first, there's a check here that uh, where we're looking at the user input, O stack 2E0. And um, this is what this check does. I'll give you the labeled version. All right, I mean, so this one here, it's uh, we I take it to be st check state. Luckily, it has a logging message, unlike pretty much just about everything else in this, uh, in this binary. 
Um, and this looks fairly simple, kind of. Um, it checks the input to see if it's equal to this token, A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, it contains checks for STSE and STTH as well. Um, but this, this is dead code. Um, there's uh, two times in the code that check state is called. And both times, the second argument is a constant. It's just the number two. So um, you know, we're seeing some kind of like, uh, this is where we start getting into a little bit of like the archaeology of this program here. Like we're, we're seeing some long buried cruft, and this will become kind of neat. I never quite solved the mystery of these two tokens, but you know, it's, a, it's a taste of some things to come here. Um, so it checks to see if the first token is A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4. If it is, it will respond. And here's where it builds up the data that it sends back to the user. So we want to see what's going on here. Um, we see it grabbing a string, um, k2 cost down uh, underscore underscore ver 3.0. And you know, this looks like some sort of device identifier. Um, it's not the public name for the router, but um, it seems to be using internally to identify the router as this router, this model. Um, and then uh, we have these three functions. To see what those do, um, let's take a look. All right, I mean, this looked fairly straightforward to, to reverse here. I open this up, I see these, uh, you know, I, I see these like uh, four telltale D words. We're looking here at an MD5 hash context. And um, this can kind of like, you know, serve you pretty well when you're reversing. If you run into some, some struct that just seems to have these uh, kind of magic numbers assigned, um, often it will turn out that you're looking at some sort of like hash initialization structure. Uh, these numbers, they might not be a set in stone that you, like, you know, have to set them up like this, but in practice they kind of are. Um, so if you see kind of a series of um, you know, magic number of constants, yeah, yeah, you, you search for it on GitHub, you Google it, whatever, you, you dig up the context. Um, and so it's you know, pretty confident here. This is just MD5 init, just a, you know, sort of a home-rolled version. Um, so we have an MD5 hash of this identifier. Um, uh, and a hash of the identifier actually is more of a, it's a hash of a 128-byte buffer where the identifier sits at the beginning and the rest is padded with zeros. Um, this is already starting to look like a bit of like a, you know, hints of standardization here, like that, um, you know, you could imagine sort of that well, on other models is a different version identifier plopped into this buffer and hashed. You know, this, this seems likely so far. Um, so it generates this hash, and if you do hit it with the magic word at the beginning, A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, it will respond with, you know, this 128, uh, or sorry, no, 32 bytes <laughs> um, of just high entropy data. That is the MD5 hash of the device identifier. So what this is, this is sort of a knock-knock who's there step of the protocol. Uh, the, the rudder is identifying itself as this particular model of rudder. This takes us to the second state, state zero. All right. So um, take a look at this. So uh, here, in the second state, a bit of a funny check there, just, you know, if it's, uh, but, um, right, we have like the, the, the state checker function. And then we have this. This is kind of neat. We, it takes the user supplied data. It checks, it, it copies, you know, the 80 bytes of it, or hex 80 bytes, you know, 128 bytes of it. Um, it then goes over to this RSA public decrypt nonce. It's expecting the user to send something that's been encrypted with a public RSA, key, or sorry, that's been encrypted with a private RSA key, which will then use the public key that's baked into the binary to decrypt. And I think this is, um, um, this is already what sort of sets this backdoor apart in its design, is it's at least kind of aiming to be a securely locked backdoor. If you don't have the master keys for it, um, you know, you shouldn't be able to kind of go through this interaction, is the thinking. Um, so it decrypts that uh, message that, you, that the user sends. I call it the nonce. I mean, you know, maybe there's some specific content that's expected. Uh, but we'll see why I just sort of you know, treat it like that. Effectively, the user sends in some data. It's decrypted with the, um, with the public key, meaning it's expecting it to have been private key encrypted. And that's you know, an expectation that we're going to see some interesting violations of soon. Um, and then uh, what it does, we're going to look at these two functions. 
Uh, it generates a random string of plain text. Uh, here it produces 31, uh, 31 bytes of printable characters, uh, ra random printable characters. Um, you see that here with the little modulus and so on in the offset. So, you know, alphanumeric and symbols. And it stores it in a global variable. Randomly generated plain text, I call it. Uh, then the next function is RSA encrypt with public key. So now it takes that public key and it encrypts the data. It's sort of, you know, more standard encryption operation. Um, and then with that gives us this, uh, its encrypted secret. It takes that it's, uh, and sends it back to the client, sort of as an authentication challenge. So you hit it with ABCD and so on. It sends back an identifying hash. That hash is presumably used in a lookup table that you, the legitimate user of this backdoor, has, um, which will then fetch the proper private RSA key. You know, you encrypt something or, or other, it set, you send it over there, it decrypts it, stores it in a variable, generates a secret, and sends it to you to decrypt, you think, right? I mean, this is kind of looking ahead a bit. Meanwhile, and how are we doing for time here? Because I got it marked at, yeah, we're doing great. Um, and then we've got these two functions that it calls way after sending, sort of setting things up for the next state. Now, this is where things get really interesting here, um, or they will. They're interesting to me. I'm hoping in hindsight, you know, maybe I can build up a little bit of suspense. Um, it takes that randomly generated plain text, it takes that decrypted nonce, and it just XORs them. And so now it has uh, you know, stores it in a global variable that I just labeled XOR message and then put the address there. You know, something I tend to do in my early drafts just so I can remember ev where everything is. Um, I tidied up most of it for the, for the presentation, but not all of it. Um, all right, so we XOR the random secret, the end of the decrypted payload, we store that. The next function, and here's th this is sort of the key. Um, I call it set ephemeral keys. What it does is it takes that XOR message. Uh, which is, you know, again, part random secret, part uh, decrypted nonce. Um, and it concatenates it with the salt perm and temp. And uh, then it hashes those with MD5 again. And it, and it uh, you know, sets the hash up in perm key and temp key, and just two more global variables. And so, you know, take a close look at this. This is going to be really significant. That's kind of where the heart of it is. Um, if you see an issue here already, you know, just uh, like write it down or something, and you can like have it in an envelope or something. When when I reveal it, it'll be more exciting that way. Um, and so here is just the fully labeled, uh, <laughs> you know, state zero, just so you can kind of see it all at a glance. There we go. How's everything? Is the font size and everything good? We're, uh, is everyone kind of good pace here? Cool. All right. Like I said, I wanted to get into the weeds with this. Now, we go to state one, the third and final state. Now, this state, um, when we're in state one, here's you know, a bit of a go-to. Most of it's contained in this branch. Um, we it, it takes the user input, which is in the variable payload buffer. It compares it to perm key, and it compares it to temp key. And if it matches either one of those, it runs a shell command. Sets up the shell command in the, you know, the branch body, then just calls system on it. So um, we see uh, we can see kind of like what this whole protocol is doing so far, right? There's a, a there's a knock knock who's there step. There is you know give me some encrypted data and I'll I'll, I'll decrypt it. To, you know you proving that you have the key, right? Kinda. Um, and then we have a generating of a, of a random secret. The secret sent back to the client, presumably to decrypt. It then generates these keys. Um, there we go. Yep. Um, it, oh, there's another little kind of a little curl in the, sta the state machine diagram here, which is that if at this stage you just send the knock knock again, it sends you back to the beginning state. Um, and here are the keys. So as I go ahead and say something, then remember I, I do have a slide like for it. All right. So how is this? How is the client supposed to determine these keys? Right. This is like the final stage of the protocol is that the client is then asked to provide an ephemeral password, which is supposed to be you know, something that can only be guessed by a legitimate client, one that has the proper like you know tool for interacting with this backdoor, which has uh, a client who has the database of private keys. So um, here's how it's built. 
Was this a review? Public key decrypted nonce. A random string of 31 printable characters. Then a null. They're XORed together. Uh, they're concatenated to the salt either uh, temp or perm. So, you know, they, they produce two different passwords with this. Uh, then the whole thing is MD5 hashed. So we're expected to use the same private key that we used to encrypt the nonce to decrypt the random secret that we get back in response. And then we can then compose an ephemeral key using the same formula the first server does, this formula. All right, so um, yeah, does, does anyone see the, what the problem might be here so far? Like any assumptions that uh, are going to get, uh, you know, this whole protocol kind of turned on its head? Okay, we don't have the private RSA key, first of all, right? Like, I, I, I looked. Um, it seemed totally possible that it could have gotten leaked. These things happen. I looked for a key pair. I formatted the public key in all sorts of different formats, like PEMS and, you know, SSH style and whatever. I searched Google and Baidu and GitHub. Yeah, there, I didn't find a leaked private key. But, so maybe there's another way of getting this, um, you know, guessing these ephemeral passwords. So we got to look a bit more closely at this part here, the concatenation step. Because although I think they're, you know, the developer is clearly thinking of this as just abstract concatenation, just sticking two things together, um, that abstraction hid something very, very important uh, from the designer of this, you know, this um, service and this protocol. Look at the way the concatenation actually works instead of ephemeral keys. Does anyone see the problem here? Like, shout it out if you see it. How are they being concatenated? S printf, right? With uh, the percent %s specifier? What's, this, what's the percent %s specifier? How does that format data? String. What kind of string? Null terminated string, yeah. Yeah, not length prefix or anything like that. Null terminated. This XORed message, is it going to be a well-formed null terminated string? Have, have they guaranteed that in any way? Have they? I mean, it's a randomly, you know, random string of printable characters. Okay, that, that part's a null terminated ASCII string, no problem there. But they XOR it with something decrypted from the client. Um, so maybe you're thinking here, oh, okay, well, you know, the client could manipulate this, but only if they have the private key, and if that case, like, you know, you're really just kind of breaking down an, a door that you have the key for. There's no point in doing that, right? Like, you won't be like, yeah, you know, I can, I can smash the window and the door to my own house where I have the key. Like, you can. Um, <laughs> but you can kind of forgive them for overlooking that. And maybe they did, right? So um, here we have um, an assumption here about null terminated data where there's no reason on earth to think it's going to be null terminated. In fact, if you had sent, um, like, you know, if you had also sent a printable string, right, um, that was an XOR with another printable random string, um, fair chance if there's any collisions, you'll have a null byte. Um, if, you sent, if you kind of just by magic guessed the exact same string, it would be a totally null buffer. But we don't need a null buffer, we need a null byte. And where would we need a null byte in order to make this password predictable? Yeah, yeah, right, right at the beginning, because then it's an empty string. You know, a, a full buffer can be an empty string if it starts with a null byte. So, yeah, you know, this makes sense, if, if, but uh, only huge assumptions. And this is where it just hit me, right? Like, I'd been hitting the wall with this for a while. I was, like, reading up on, like, RSA, Oracle, tax, and so on. It was just, like, you know, and I, I was hitting the wall for, like, a week or more. And then I just decided to diagram out what I had. I'm like, all right, well, maybe this is a wrap here, but at least I can kind of document it. I'm doing the little protocol diagram, going through it step by step again, and then I just see it's not a concatenation. It's, a, it's like, you know, not abstractly. It's an S print F. It's a null, it, 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 it's making huge assumptions about a null terminated string that just do not hold water. So I'm like, yeah, I am. Just exploding warthog heading here. This is freaking great. All right, so now we need to find some control. Right? We're not quite there yet. If we had a way to make this, the first byte of this randomly generated message zero, we could, predict, e we could uh, easily predict the ephemeral passwords. Right? They'd just be the hashes of the salts, that's all. And we know the salts because we can dump them. We can string dump them. Um, so, uh, yeah, how do we make the first byte of this zero? 
with any probability if we don't have the private key? Well, let's look at the public key, uh, the public decrypt nonce function again, because there's an important detail here that's really easy to overlook, especially if you're just familiar to the way RSA is used in just about any application that uses RSA. Um, you, you might forget that it's doing what happens when you do kind of a slightly antique textbook RSA decryption with no padding. That three is an enum, which is defined in the OpenSSL code base as RSA no padding. You know what that means? It's, 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 it's friggin' great. Like, we don't need the corresponding RSA key to have some control over what an unpadded application of RSA public decrypt does to our input. If we just want to control the first byte of the plain text, trial and error is going to be enough. Like, there's only so many bytes. There's 256 of them. All right, and you know, if we, if in fact, this is kind of funny. I was just sort of taking a look. Um, just, uh, just early this morning, actually, I was looking back at the documentation in OpenSSL 1.0.0, or maybe I'd point 0 0.2, and. Um, the documentation had gone a little bit stale. If you look at what they have for public decrypt, they don't even like mention the padding parameter, right? So I mean, this stuff has just sort of been sitting in a text file since um, you know before I guess was it PKCS 1.5 or whatever. Um, it's just been like you know sitting there unchanged. You have to the signature of the functions changed. Um, I just grepping, you know, found this, um, but it's a nice like clear explanation of what textbook RSA does. Um, just nice to review, right? I mean, it takes your plain text, it raises it to the exponent E, and this, in, you know, kind of by uh, custom, if that tends to be hex, uh, I'm gonna get the zero count right here, hex 10,001, right? And then it's gonna mod it by RSA N, um, which is the public key, the public key modulus. Um, now, what can you apply this function to? Like, any number, I mean, except for maybe implementation quirks in there, you can just pass it any, any byte string, I mean, right? Which is then converted to a big num, and then they perform this operation on it. Um, so you can like pass anything to public decrypt. It doesn't have to actually be ciphertext, in the sense of it doesn't have to be something that someone else has already enciphered. And um, so I did a little more, like, you know, just background reading here. Um, and this is the essay that introduces OAEP, which is the padding algorithm that's used in RSA um, PKCS version two or something. I should have had this written in front of me. I'm really not a cryptographer, and if I make any mistakes in cryptography or Chinese, um, someone can just jump in, right? Or, you know, financial analysis or whatever at the end. Like I'm kind of just just winging it, um, but. You know, I just sit down, do some reading, and yeah, and you learn a thing or two. So I found just this um, this little paragraph here. A variety of goals for encryption have come to be known, which are actually stronger than the notion of. <laughs> These include non-malleability and chosen ciphertext security. We introduce a new notion of, of an encryption scheme being plain text aware. Roughly said, it should be impossible for a party to produce a valid ciphertext without knowing the corresponding plain text. In the ideal hash model that we assume, this notion can be shown to imply non-malleability and chosen ciphertext security. Now, I'm not gonna go any further into these particular weeds of OAEP because this doesn't use OAEP. It doesn't use any padding scheme. Um, so this uh, RSA unpadded, textbook RSA, is a, f a form of encryption that is not plain text aware. Yeah, that's it. All right, so if we can produce a phony but valid ciphertext knowing only the public key, what do we want to do with that? It should be kind of coming to light here, right? Um, so this, the Telenet D startup service places very few constraints on what the corresponding plain text should be. Although it kind of looks superficially like a, like a max signature check, it's not doing that. Like it's, there's, it's not really checking the, 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 the plain text for anything. Um, it's just kind of taking it and doing some manipulations to it. In fact, it is making assumptions about it, but it doesn't check them. Uh, you can kind of just like, you know, tease out what those assumptions might be, but like, um, that's just, you know, that's the kind of like, your, uh, what's the, you know, the, the hermeneutic part of reverse engineering there. You're trying to like to sort of suss out the designer's intentions so that you can then you subvert them by comparing it to like what the, you know, what the program is actually doing. 
Um, so it checks to see if it's a string, uh, or this is, sorry, a string length check. Um, but it's not going to be, like, unless there's a memory corruption, it's never going to be bigger than that because the key itself is only 1,024 bits. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe they're designing this in a way that can be extended for larger key sizes in the future. Like, it is meant to be kind of like a plug and play system. Um, so, the random secret contains only printable characters, which are, you know, ones in this range, right? Um, and the random secret is XORed with the decrypted nonce that we control. Um, and so if we randomly generate a nonce that decrypts to an array of bytes that begins with a printable character, we got a 194, or hex 5D or whatever, chance of causing an XOR collision that makes the XOR message begin with a null byte. One in 94 chance for cracking like a cryptographic you know, password with a, with, a, with a fucking computer, like that's, that's good, right? I mean, you know, your, your bike lock has better security than that. Like your cheap bike, your dollar store bike lock. <laughs> You know, where you get like three or four numbers in a row. That's at least going to take someone like 10,000 guesses. Uh, but no, one in 94, we can do this if we set it up right. Um, and then, like we said, if it starts with a null byte, boom, the concatenation is just perm and temp, like the, which means what's all that gets hashed is the salt. So, demo time. I got a couple demos here. I didn't have a video, I'm just going to do it live. Um, so, wish me luck. And, uh, if I have to walk out of here head hung low and shamefaced, you know, um, just remember that like I went out there without a net. All right, so got this little VM here. Oh, you know, the only trouble I had setting this up so far was just I got like traveling with my work MacBook, right? You know, I just had all this out on Linux. I'm like, oh, I'll just dockerize it or whatever. Like weird things happened. Anyway, luckily I do have this VM set up for the, the workshop I took this week, the baseband exploitation. It's the same machine. Fantastic course, if anyone has a chance to take it next year. Had a great time there. But right now, we're going to use this to hack this router from. Let's make sure that it is awake. And so 8.2.1. Boy, I got those demo fingers going. You never count on that, right? Like, you're not going to be able to type at your regular speed. Um, it's, it's pinging. All right, so lockpick. Um, lockpick target 192.168.2.1. Um, this, I'll explain what this variable means in a bit. This is the protocol selector, three. I named them, one, two, and three. This is the guy, right? Uh, the fact that the lid is off shouldn't really be that, shouldn't concern you. I just, you know, I'm, I'm better at taking these things apart than putting them back together. Plastic gets cracked. Sometimes I use horrible and, like, violent means to get them apart, like, you know, air guns and shit. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is just, this doesn't require hardware access. Um, let's see if it works, okay. Boom, we're in, root shell. All right, thank you. Yeah, there we go. There we are, yep, there's our guy. We got root, um, unauthenticated root over LAN, there you go. Um, so, are other models and firmware versions affected? Let's see, I'm about at half time now, and you know what? I'm about where I should be at half time. Okay, good, good. Um, so, to find out, I ordered FICOM's newest consumer router, the one that was, you know, the most recently made, the K3C. Eh? Yeah, yeah, Vanna Whitener up here. Um, and, uh, oh, hey, it's me. Ah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, while I waited for it to arrive, and it took a minute, I just went scouring the Chinese language router hacking forums, which are really great. You know, I mean, if, uh, I feel like I could learn a lot more about router hacking if my Chinese was better. So maybe that will, maybe that will motivate me to take the plunge. Um, for, you know, I looked around for as many leaked firmware blobs as I could find, you know, going through like, the Wayback Machine. I was like finding people's like FTP shares. I was hoping that nobody was trying to trap me and put something horrible up there. But, you know, I went and grabbed as many as I could. Um, and I, I was able to identify three different variations of this protocol. Now, this was itself kind of interesting because um, just a bit of an aside here. When you see something that looks like that kind of complex and just this baroque for something as simple as like a knock knock, let me in, you know, give me the give me the tail nap, um, you uh, oh man, I can see myself. 
go away from that. Uh, it's really distracting. All right. No, this, you don't have to stop. I mean, it's okay. Other people can see me. It's cool. Um, right, right. So, I mean, when I first saw that, uh, my first thought was like, wow, this seems like kind of, you know, involved for a one-off deal. Like, why would they go through all this trouble and add all this complexity um, for something that could be much simpler, you'd think, right? Especially since that complexity didn't seem to give them any security. Um, didn't seem to give them the, you know, complete security anyway. Um, so my first sort of slightly paranoid thought was, which, you know, we were telling kind of uh, the boss at work, I'm like, I'm wondering if I found like a standardized backdoor protocol, you know, like does anyone kind of know anything about this? And no one did. Um, so then, you know, w w this sort of resulted in, um, you know, a little bit of nervousness up the chain at work about like how we're going to like disclose this or publicize this. Because um, if it is something like a standardized, mandated backdoor protocol, you know, of the sort we saw in, um, you know, in Travis's, like, really cool talk just a moment ago uh, with, like, the clipper chip. Yeah, you know, there, there can be some real political interest in keeping it kind of, kind of locked down. I mean, this is, I'm clearly getting into some kind of delusions of grandeur at this point. I'm like, wow, did I find, like, you know, is this, like, uh, sneakers or whatever? You know, like, did I find the box? Uh, yeah, I mean... Um, but uh, so we, we're kind of, we kind of like soft pedal. They soft pedaled the disclosure for this a little bit. Not that it's the company, which I tried. I'll tell that story at the end of the talk. But at least as far as like, are we going to make a public thing about this? The pendulum swung back and forth pretty wildly at the time because um, they didn't want to like you know invite retribution if it turned out to be serious. Again, I mean, you know, getting a little bit paranoid there. But it can happen. The imagination runs wild. But uh, so I, gra I went and dug up all these, all, all these variations of FICOM router firmware uh, dating back to 2017. Um, and uh, they're released on a variety of architectures, MIPS cell, MIPS, ARM. Um, and some, I got some that were released, well, one that was released for the international market, this guy, and uh, others released just for the Chinese market. Um, you know, organize them by version number and so on, uh, scan them for like, fingerprints. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, just hash the Telnet D startup binary so I knew how many I'd actually have to look at carefully, right? Um, now, uh, what I noticed was, you don't, it's not until the more recent batch in 2018 that you start seeing any kind of device identifier in there or seeing the ABC, key, like ABC, DEF, one, two, three, four handshake. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, there's no variation on the uh, public in like private keys, you know, the public keys use, I'll get to the private part, in the binaries. Older versions all use the same one. Hilariously, the first, the oldest ones I was able to find, the K2 and the K3C, the, now the algorithm I'm gonna show in a bit, much the same, but it includes both the private and the public key, uh, the full RSA key pair. It doesn't even use the private key. Like someone just sort of forgot you know, or like didn't really know what they were doing and just, you know, like, oh, our, I better put the whole key in there, right? Um, I mean, it's like right there in the name, you know, private key. <laughs> anyway, um, so they released that. Then they, uh, I'll show you what happened there. It's very, very funny. I mean, to me, I, I thought it was really funny. Um, and I sort of, you know, look at some of the other kind of traits of it. One cute thing is in some of the er old ones, the, you know, the temp in perm salts, um, are actually temp and perp, like some typo that just sort of lasted for a few releases. Um, so you can get like, you know, temporary and per per perpendicular access to the router. Um, it's all good. And I tested every one of these I found, um, just, you know, set spinning something up through Kimu. Uh, usually not full system emulation, but like enough, like I'd throw in like a little like Kimu true, right? Like with a static Kimu in there. Um, just to make sure I could kind of get it to, uh, you know, to the point where it's trying to launch Telnet. Often as a result, just because of the way these, you know, these particular MIPS uh, architectures are set up, it would instead throw an illegal instruction exception when it tries to call uh, the system call clone. But, you know, I, I could at least see what was about to happen. Uh, then th these two, of course, I tested in hardware. All right, so let's take a little walk through history here. Backdoor protocol version one. Um, yeah, I, I really love this part of the work where you're doing kind of like, you know, it's almost like uh, feeling like an archaeologist of some sort there, right? You're just trying to like uh, understand like the reasoning and the design for this system by like looking at kind of you know, earlier failed attempts. Um, or, 
you know, partial successes um, or just earlier iterations. You can kind of like start to understand like the, you know, the reasoning for this thing as you as you pull, peel back its history. Um, so here, the FICOM K2 router. Here's a little picture of it. Looks kind of similar. Different architecture there. Um, I think it's Big Endian. Um, and so if you look at the set ephemeral keys function, um, you know, the rest of the algorithm, similar shape. Um, we see one difference here, which is that it's not using, uh, I just labeled this myself, um, it's not using the XOR secret message, it's just taking the decrypted nonce, which is the de decryption of like what the client sends, and it's just um, you know, concatenating it right there. So this means that there's a, you know, the same vulnerability affects this, but just uh, it's a little bit simpler. Whereas before, you want to make sure, you want to come up with a phony ciphertext that just happens to have a printable character at the beginning, because that gives you a 1 in 94 chance of collision. If you're hitting protocol 1, you want to come up with a ciphertext that has a null byte at the beginning, right? And then, you know, you're good. Um, because luckily, RSA is used to encrypt binary data and doesn't assume you're dealing with a null terminated string. Um, so, uh, very similar attack can be performed here. Of course, they left the key under the mat. So, like, you don't actually have to do it this way. I did, because, you know, I, I like the elegance of it. I didn't want to have to. It's like, you know, when you're playing chess, sometimes, like, you get a really satisfying game. You get, like, a check, and you're like, oh, yeah, that was, you know. And then sometimes someone just kind of, like, absentmindedly like, hangs their queen, and you're like, you know, and, and you kind of clobber them. But, like, you know what all hung on a blunder. Most chess games I played probably kind of go like that way for me when I lose them. You know, like it's, they're decided on blunders at the early level, and it's like, okay, it's still a win, but it doesn't feel as good. <laughs> so uh, this one, I was like, all right, I'm not going to try just, you know, just using the key. Let's try and do this the hard way, and it worked. Um, here's a little diagram of protocol one. I think that's nice and legible, just to review how it all works. Um, so um, the user produces a message. It could be random or whatever. Maybe there's something they use, but I'm going to know without seeing the client code. Um, so I call it a nonce, because I've been using random ones. Um, it concatenates them, creates the passwords. The user has to guess the passwords, which in theory would mean the user has the key. But in practice means the user can take advantage of um, textbook RSA not being plain text aware. And so same attack works. Um, in where you create the uh, MD5 hash, you just hash the salt of your choice and you send that as the password and boom, you're in. So, um, yeah, like I said, the most obvious flaw is that they just bakes the private key into the binary. Um, it's totally unforced error, right? They didn't need it. Um, it was just gratuitously there. And you can see it right there. It's the 9FC string there, um, which you can just grep for, <laughs> like, to see, you know, how many instances had that. Um, a handy trick, if you do like a string dump, um, I like hitting with like the offset, like a TX, and then um, set the string length to like 256 characters. You can find like, do a dump of, you know, hex keys. <laughs> um, so there we go. Boom! They left it right there. Hilarious. Um, so tools for exploiting this backdoor, this in these earlier models, do exist in the wild. Thanks again to these forums that I was just crawling on, Google translating as I went, poorly. Um, but I did find this tool, which I you know, spun up in a little Windows VM, crossing my fingers that wasn't going to do anything too devious, and just try, you know, reverse this a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it, ha it does contain itself like the private key. It sa con consistently it sends this message repeatedly over the air um, when, you, like, when you start it up, when you, like, when you point it at its target. Um, and so it's really just going right ahead to, you know, to that stage of the protocol that I showed you earlier. Um, it occurred to me this morning that like, since I have the private key, I should actually decrypt that and see what that buffer is. And I'm like, that, I, I, how did I not do that? Like, I'm so curious now. Like, what actually are they sending? I was just ignoring the private key route so entirely, I forgot that I actually have it. Um, and then I thought, okay, no, it's like a few hours before my talk. This is clearly a rabbit hole. I want to dive down it. I can't believe I haven't yet. But like, I really got to finish these slides and, you know, so. Something to so you can take home with you. What does that say? I bet it is it something funny. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, and this is what it looks like trying to um, use the Google I, uh, the translation mode on like a VM screen, because um, <laughs> you I couldn't for whatever reason I'm just not much of a Windows person. I couldn't figure out how to copy the text off the GUI, 
Like, it was just kind of, like, rasterized into it. So I'm like, all right, I'm just, like, pointing the camera at it, and it's, like, just saying all sorts of weird things to me. Um, version 2. So that, th version 2 was uh, the next color in my little table. So, um, like I say, the, finally, the, this guy arrived off Amazon. And, you know, I mean, at this point when it arrived, I didn't quite understand about these different protocol versions yet, right? This sort of accumulated over time. Um, and it's funny, because uh, the version, uh, the, the um, firmware blob that I found for K3C was for the domestic market, and it was exactly the same as the K2G, um, except that, um, you know, like, uh, well, <laughs> there was a, fun, a couple of fun surprises there. But, um, yeah, it was pretty much the same deal, um, except it was, like, compiled to a different architecture and so on. Uh, bi big Endian MIPS, I think it was, instead of Little Endian. Um, but this one didn't, right? Like, I tried to interact with my tool at first, and it wasn't working. It was, like, clearly doing something a bit different. And they'd also patched the command injection, so I didn't have a good way of getting a shell at first. I really wanted to see what was going on in this. Um, and I hadn't really figured out, like I said, the whole history of the protocol. So, um, didn't work there. You know, scanned it and all that. Well, okay, we do have port 21, 21, 0. That's promising. Um, let's get inside and take a closer look. Um, so, took it apart. It does have a UART port. Nice. That, you know, you, you come to expect. Great. I really do not have fantastic hardware skills. I and really didn't at this point. I, but I did have a hot air gun. Um, and I opened a window. And I just kind of burrowed my way into it. Um, got my UART pin soldered, though, without hurting myself badly and, like, you know, minimal brain damage and uh, good, right? Um, got my little bridge, this little guy, plugged it in, got to work. Um, and so f what this gave me, once I figured out the right um, minicom settings, which took a minute, um, which I do have written down somewhere, um, you know, I go into a U-boot menu if I interrupt the, bo the, the booting. The funny thing is at first I was, like, you know, just... I was getting something wrong in the minicom setup, and I thought it was read-only. So I was like actually trying to—I was interrupting the boot process by like glitching the wire, you know, to send a signal over. And I was like, "Oh, this is yeah, wow, that's clever." And then I realized I just like there's a menu option. <laughs> but so I'm like, "Oh man, that was like that was a stunt." Um, and now it's just clearly like I just did not read the documentation. Um, anyway, so I got into a little uh, U-boot menu, unauthenticated. I'm able to dump the NAND. Uh, the format of the NAND, a little bit curious. I dumped it with a little expect script. I found some one that somebody else had written for another router. I made the proper modifications to it, and I threw it on this one. Let it run overnight. Got a big hex dump. We serialized it. Just kind of took a look at it, right? Lots of high entropy blobs in there. Um, it's got um, an et cetera password. Oh, but so most of it was like this encrypted base64, or base64 encrypted something. It was kind of weird, or compressed, and the algorithm I didn't know. I did find, however, a plain text, et cetera, password file. I threw Hashcat on it, and boom, got the password. It was admin. So yes, I could have guessed. But you know, I, it was winter, probably, and I, it kept, my, kept me warm. Um, so um, <laughs> I loaded the binary once I got in there, pulled it off into Ghidra. And the goddamn thing is already labeled, right? Like, oh, that's cool. I was so like proud of my labeling, you know. Like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, well now we already got a labeled version. Lesson here is if you have an unlabeled binary, there might be a labeled build of it around somewhere. Um, but there we go. Um, I, the, uh, you see a you know, very similar shape algorithm, except it doesn't have the knock knock part. It doesn't do the A B C D E F one two three four part. It doesn't have a device identifier. Um, and in fact, here we go in public decrypt. Um, Funnily enough, Ghidra actually didn't load the string table where it was pointing to there. So I'm like, that's fine. Let's do it the sh easy way. We'll just call strings. And we see that um, the public key string is, in fact, at that offset. There is no private key in there. But doesn't that look familiar? Look at that public key. Does this look familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same one they had with the leaked pair. And just, you know, they're like, well, they, they redacted part of it. They didn't change it. It's not like it's that hard. Are random numbers so rare in your line of work? Like, are you, are you hoarding all your random, all your entropy to feed your starving children that you can't just generate another one? I guess, you know, they already probably had their, like, the client code deployed, and, you know, then you can break compatibility with that. 
who knows what arrangements are made for the access of these things. So, you know, they redact and hope for the best. Um, same public key <laughs> used the, um, back in the K2. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, you just hope for the best. Um, but it's all right, like I said, I don't actually need the private key, and I wanted to do this like in a more interesting way. Um, you know, we do kind of exploit it in a principled way, not just went on a blender. Um, so, uh, it's already plugged in, yeah, let's do this. We have demo two here, won't take long. Let's do it. Let's uh, use that tool. Um, okay. Uh, so here are the protocol diagram for this version. You can kind of like step through this quickly. I don't want to take too much of uh, the next person's time slot. I think we're at like a 10 minute offset anyway, so we should be okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the same protocol minus the, you know, knock knock who's there step. And now I think it's very clear that the knock knock who's there step was introduced when they s decided we can't keep using the same leaked key. Um, each device should have, or each model should have its own key, and that should be associated with an identifier. So someone clearly made that decision, right? Um, and then the client tool, whatever it is, would contain a database of private keys that were just keyed to, or you know, associated with um, the device identifier hashes. We're good. Um, but yeah, same protocol, which means we can exploit it in the same way. We just skip the knock-knock. Um, and so, demo time. Um, let's, all right, oh, here we go. <laughs> all right, I left Telnet running on that little thing, but not on this thing here, too. So, um, ping 192.168.2.1, please connect, yes. Um, let me just satisfy you all that Telnet is not currently running on it, good. Sometimes I leave it running and forget. Um, it's less impressive, honestly. Um, a lock pick. Oh, let's go back up there. Lock pick here, protocol selector two. I figured I could have something in here that does a little like fingerprinting or whatever, but you know, I mean, it's one of those things where it could be fun to program that, but I'm really just saving myself like two keystrokes, so this is fine. All right, here we go. Boom, we're in. All right, we have root on this device too now. Thank you. Info, yeah, oh, no, God. see, you, you, f you forget basic things sometimes. There we go. Um, now, back to the talk. That's the last demo I got here, so now I'm just gonna wrap up here now. Protocol version three, this is back where we started. Um, and here, yeah, I have my little theory about why these, like, this added complexity, where it came from, what motivated it, and I mean, you know, like, never assume malice when incompetence <laughs> does the trick, right? Uh, they, what we have are layers and layers of complexity that were added as poorly understood attempts to fix an issue with the previous one. Sometimes it'd be an issue that they were, th uh, you know, that um, if you want to say like, well, what issue was it fixing with the first protocol? Uh, the leaked key, they didn't seem to pay that much mind. I think they just kind of hope for the best. But um, one thing you might remember for the first version of the protocol is that it's actually vulnerable to like a replay style attack. You can just packet sniff see what the authenticating uh, message is, right? It's just sent over the clear over UDP, and then use that as the key. And so if you throw in a random string generator and like an XOR and so on, you're at least ha creating like a challenge response protocol where it's not just vulnerable to a replay attack. Okay, so they did solve that problem. And, you know, credit where credit is due. Um, and then um, they, uh, at some point, they're like, hey, you know, remember that key that we, <laughs> we actually, you know, pushed to production? Um, and like distributed with routers, maybe we should use a different one, maybe we should keep track of our keys, maybe we should, we should have a system for looking up new keys and so on. Um, and you can almost imagine that like having a database of keys, we can just look them up. The need for this was probably that like, you know, just doing a router side switch of the key would have broken compatibility with the client tools. So they had to coordinate that a little bit better and it couldn't be done all at once, right? Like, I mean, these things take time, especially like, you know, who are the clients for using these client tools? Is it just, um, are we just talking about like, uh, you know, FICOM employees? Are we talking about law enforcement? Um, you know, this, uh, th there's ma many parties that might have an interest in having like the backdoor keys for a router. Um, and you can't just break all of their tools overnight without like some coordination. So, um, here we go. Um, I just did, there's my little collection of Telnet D startups. Um, here I am just like dumping key length strings from them. You can see what's in what. Um, and here's the diagram of protocol three, which I've probably repeated enough that it should be 
You know, everyone should be able to implement this from memory. In fact, in the Tenable Community CTF last year, there was a challenge where it was just my implementation of this protocol. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a fun one. I think uh, there were a couple, a couple solutions, but not too many. It was like really in the sweet spot. I was happy with that. Um, all right, so there's protocol three. You know, knock, knock, who's there? Um, nonce, decrypted, um, secret plain text, XORD, ephemeral keys. You guess them with the, by the hash. Um, and, yeah, then it opens. So the responsible disclosure process. I work at Tenable. I'm on the zero day team. Um, when we find a vulnerability, um, you know, what we do is that we have it all here. Yeah, we, you know, we contact the vendor. We give them a 90-day warning. We say that we are going public with this vulnerability, um, but we prefer coordinated disclosure if possible. If you res if they respond, the 90-day clock um, set it starts from when we sent the contact. You know, the su successful contact. If they don't respond, they have a 45-day limit, right? And then we just go ahead and publish. And this works pretty well. You know, most of the time there's cooperation. Um, it has kind of a nice balance of like, we're not going to make this too hard on you, but we have to take this seriously because we are going to release one way or another. So I go through the moves, you know, and this is kind of the tedious part of the job, and it's the part of the job where you're most likely to anger someone, and so it's like, okay. Um, so I'm like sending out my emails, they're getting bounced back. Um, oh, okay, it's funny, like everything seems kind of shuttered, that's weird, like you change email servers like all at once and like not tell anyone that was funny um i tried to reach out of other channels i found that there was like uh, for example an official f uh t you know i think it was official um telegram account for ficom so i'm like oh i'll just reach out over telecom you know or telegram tel telegram yeah so reach out over telegram didn't look promising um <sighs> like I'm, I'm seeing this i'm just like oh f jesus um Oh, geez. <laughs> like, I'm feeling kind of bad. Um, anyway, finally, I get a response from uh, their German team. You know, they're, they're, it's good. They're very, very punctual there. Um, so, uh, and they tell me that FICOM has closed all business worldwide since 2019. Their devices are still for sale. Um, it's a little mysterious exactly what the chicanes just went through, but, you know, things are being worked out, but for the worse. Like, thing, it, it is either dead or it is very much dying. Now, uh, many of you probably have not heard of FICOM before. Um, if any of you maybe are uh, familiar with like, the tech, uh, the tech uh, industry in China, hopefully uh, I think you are. It's, uh, you know, this was one of the bigger router companies, uh, one, one of the um, like bigger electronics companies. Um, when, uh, you know, they were referred to as like little Huawei in the press and so on, but like, just, just little, right? Like, this is one of the big guys. Um, this wasn't just some little fly-by-night shop, and it's a shop that had been around for, like, you know, a couple decades. Um, so this was a pretty big upset that this happened. So, you know, I'm curious. So um, here we go, a little potted history. Here's uh, Google Ping. Um, I think I made the faux pas here. I meant to correct this. I start referring to him by his, like, you know, given name. We're not that familiar. I should have referred to him as Goo here, if I'm even saying that right. Again, I apologize. But um, yeah, so he found uh, Shanghai Fixin. Um, later, it comes to be known as FICOM. Um, Lianbi Le Financial, which will be a player in this story, uh, founded in 2012. I'm not sure who founded it exactly at the time. 2014, FICOM has declared an operating income of about $1.5 billion US, about 2 billion or so Canadian, uh, 10 billion yuan. Um, it uh, initiates a merger with, uh, goddamn, I don't know how to pronounce exactly, but Huiku Technology, formerly a pharmaceutical company. Um, and Google gains control then of Yanbi Financial. This is something that only comes to light later in legal documents. Uh, it was, you know, I think it was uh, announced as a partnership at the time. Um, FICOM in 2015 announces this is what sinks them the zero yuan purchase plan, full rebate on every router purchased. If, We'll see what if in a minute. Um, Hiku, if I'm saying that right, discloses that Gu had uh, gained control of their company as well. His, uh, uh, Gu Ping's affiliate, uh, Jian Yan, uh, receives the largest fine in history from the Chinese Security Regulatory Commission. I think this is like the Chinese SEC of 500 million US dollars. Um, and uh, then in 2016, Gu claims to have lost financial control of FICOM. It's like, what's, what's going on here? 
So the zero yuan purchase plan had kind of a fun history to it here. You, this means you could get a full rebate on Flycom routers and like smart home devices if you register for the Lianbi Financial and Huaxia Wanijia Financial peer-to-peer -peer lending apps. Does anyone know what peer-to-peer -peer lending is? It's like a sort of a blockchain mediated complicated Ponzi scheme. And for a while it was like booming in China for like a few real brief years, like really brief years. And then um, in around 2018 or so, you start seeing news stories tra awkwardly translated saying things like, you know, the thunder has fallen on the P2P lending racket. And, uh, you know, there was just a massive government uh, clean sweep of, uh, 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 you know, of all these P2P companies, P2P lending companies. Um, just, you know, rounding them up, there was just a uh, you know, huge law enforcement effort and it's done now. Like, you cannot do this in China anymore. However, when you bought a rudder, you would get this rebate, you get all your money back if you set up for these peer-to-peer -peer lending schemes where, uh, whereupon you're encouraged to get these cheap loans, you're uh, promised you know, huge returns on your investments in the app, um, like unrealistically large returns, you know, alarm bell ringing returns if you're not like yourself like, you know, in finance or whatever. Um, but, uh, or I mean, if you are in finance, you'd be like, that's a suspicious looking return. But, uh, no, like, you know, like I said, it was a distributed cryptocurrency-enabled Ponzi scheme um, running in China. And uh, you're like, uh, no, here's the neat thing, I didn't talk about this yet, but one of the demons on these routers is called ad push. And I wish the upstream servers were still operating so I could see what it was pushing. But what it would do is it would solicit an upstream server, they're all dead now, and it would grab some like, you know, advertisements or whatever, and then just inject them into your browser sessions. Um, <laughs> like just serving you adware from the router. Um, yeah, I'll just like, maybe I'll dig a little deeper into that sometime. I wanted to understand that better. Um, but yeah, you know, you can have access to that binary when you get in there too. Um, and um, here we go. So, um, you know, I found this sort of interesting paper. This is just recently came out, and I have yet to kind of dig into it all myself, but if you want to do a little further reading, there is a paper out there in uh, you know, preprint, Crime and Crisis in China's P2P Online Lending Market, a Comparative Analysis of Fraud. And this uh, you know, sort of tells the story. So Lianbi, this was a financial company that uh, Gu uh, obtained you know, controlling interest in, set up this sort of like promotional partnership with FICOM, and basically used this flourishing router company. Like this was a multi-billion dollar company to hawk a Ponzi scheme to its user base in exchange for free routers. So there's quite a few of these things on the market. You can find a bunch of these things on Shodan where you shouldn't find them because that means you've enabled remote management. You should never, ever, ever do this with a router, never with a commercial router. There is, I swear to God, no good reason for doing this. And I don't actually have it in this talk here, but um, uh, the, you know, if, you, if you Google me and some keywords from here, you can find another POC, which is actually a WAN side, if they enable remote management, for the K2G, um, where you can basically hit an unauthenticated endpoint and say, could I have the Wi-Fi passwords, please? And we'll give you them back in base64, like pre-auth. And um, how often do you find that on someone's router, unless they're particularly security-minded and you, you probably didn't give you access, they have a different admin password from a Wi-Fi password? Like, people only like to have one password, if, you know, right? Like, and uh, for especially for one device. Like, no one's out there, like, setting the router up. I'm like, well, I really better set up, you know, I better set up a dis different password for my admin and my Wi-Fi, and then I better put it on, on the internet with remote management. <laughs> like, no, no, nobody's making both of those decisions, which means that you can actually just hit an endpoint on any router that has remote management, ask it for the Wi-Fi password, the Wi-Fi password will turn out to probably be, uh, not that I checked, um, will probably be the admin password. You can walk right into the UI for commanding the router. Um, you can do that command injection I showed you, throw a reverse shell, and you're in, you have root on that router. So like, I mean, anyway, that's a bit of an aside. That's just for, you know, that's not on the slides. Um, I think the back door is more interesting, but like that's kind of a bit more devastating. So, yes, um, <laughs> the MB Financial filed on suspicion of illegally absorbing public deposits, which I think is a term of art for a Ponzi scheme. Uh, Gu Guoping is arrested. Um, the Shanghai number one intermediate court in 2021, and this was like right when I was just finishing this research. This stuff was like happening in the news. Um, if you look at the search for the Chinese news, it didn't really get much coverage out west. Um, so uh, the intermediate people's court holds a public hearing for fraud, 
uh, the Songjian police arrest the Lianbi personnel. So I mean, this is a whole roundup, right? Like everyone's going down. And just again, to be clear, Gu Guoping isn't like just some nobody. Like he, he's a billionaire, right? Like, I mean, this is, you know, like this is like rounding up. Uh, Bezos would probably be an overstatement. That's more like the Alibaba guy. But like this is like one of the big guys, right? Like um, whoever's running up or whatever, I don't know. Um, so yeah, he was arrested. Um, and on the morning of December 8, uh, the Shanghai Number One Intermediate People's Court publicly sentenced the defendants, Gu Guoping and associates, on the case of fundraising fraud. Gu was sentenced to life imprisonment for the crime of fundraising fraud, deprived of political rights for life, and confiscated of all personal property. So what does this mean for our routers? <laughs> <sighs> yeah, probably no patches. Um, which means, you know, um, now, some good news. I ha have noticed on the OpenWRT forums and so on that there are some instructions for flashing these. Uh, the OpenWRT on the older model of the routers where people know how to get root access. Um, now you can get root access on these ones too. And probably, with a little bit of tinkering, you can get the firmware of your choice installed. And like, you know, maybe they're getting a little bit scarce now, but like last year I could still find them on like, you know, for like 10, 15 bucks. They're really cheap, and the antenna is at least strong enough that when I forget that I've left my little research router on, I'm getting the signal like a, f you know, a few doors down the street, like when I'm going for a walk. I'm like, oh, look, FICOM 5E, you know, with some stupid password set on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have left that running. Anyway, probably pretty decent hardware on the cheap. The, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the zero yuan rebate plan is no longer in effect. Um, so you will have to take your peer-to-peer -peer lending elsewhere. Um, and uh, thank you. That's all. <laughs> all right. Uh, question. Oh, um, I'm seeing something, but it's like my eyesight is just not up to the job. It's probably saying go ahead and take questions because we have all the time in the world. Uh, any questions? You mentioned that there's that ad push service, but all of the servers are down. Is the domain name up for registration? Has it expired? <laughs> oh, that's an excellent question. You know what? If uh, whoever wants to come up and like, do I want to give these away? Not quite. Whoever wants the firmware dumps of all of my, my little firmware collection, it's actually up in my GitHub. I didn't put the link there. Um, there are some compile bugs right now. I'm going to put a release at the end of the day. Like one of my really rude upsets when I got here is that now the last compilation of this tool where I thought I'd made trivial changes is like having some issues. So, um, but it built fine on Linux, continues to do so. I'm going to have the tool up there. It's at my uh, GitHub, which I think is, yeah, um, Oblivious Simplex on GitHub. Um, and if you just go, the repo's name is just backdoor lockpick, backdoor hyphen lockpick. Um, so sort of a mangled sort of Git history, but it's still the same URL that's referenced in a Medium article that I kind of wrote up, like you know, same material. Um, you can get my tool. You can submit a patch if you figure out what's going wrong with the Apple build process. It works fine on Linux, I think. Um, and um, you can uh, you know grab my little firmware collection and add to it if you find it, because it would be kind of fun to like get even more. Just you know, have this FICOM uh, firmware collection and just build it up. Um, all right, and they're all like, you know, nice little tar balls, you know, they're not, uh, they're not blobs. Um, yeah, so uh, any other questions? I think I'm probably going to uh, be, oh, it's, all the, it's almost left. quarter two. I probably should wrap up. Uh, oh, hey, yeah. Yeah, is, so is this magic UDP port accessible through the WAN interface? I wish, I mean, no, but, uh, it, it seems no. For that, you're going to need the other trick. Ah, um, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can't have it all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, let me go like dig through my old like browser history databases and stuff. I'll find those. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll put together, I'll, I'll put those in a little like text file. Yeah. Um, I think write.com.cn or something like that, like the word R-I-G-H-T. 
That one I think I found a bunch on. That one sticks out. But uh, yeah, it's a very active router hacking community. I hope I did them justice. I'm kind of hoping that like whoever wrote like root ACK pro, the you know protocol one, and I think protocol two hacker, um, you know, if, because I, I've seen some chatter on the forums that there's no tool for the new ones. So I hope uh, hope they can find my tool somehow and like uh, benefit from it, you know, despite the the, the the language and tech community barrier there. Um, and their tools run on Windows. And I'm sure someone could do a Windows build of my tool. It's mostly pretty simple. Uh, Let's see. Quick question. Yeah. Over to your right. <laughs> uh, were there any other obfuscation techniques used by the ELF binary? Because um, it looks like they were just okay. relying purely on the one encryption routine, but that was it. It looked like it was completely plain code, no other obfuscation. Oh, yeah. Um, no, actually, I was fortunate. There wasn't a whole lot of, of obfuscation there. Um, and it's funny, like, now, when I'm looking back on it, like, it was one of my kind of early, like, wins at uh, Tenable, like, you know, in, I guess, fall 2019, or fall of 2020, early 2021. And so at the time, I'm thinking, like, you know, I'm going back and looking, I'm like, well, this is actually pretty simple. Like, it's very much just plain English, you know, as, as it is when you look at, like, older work. And I'm like, oh, I'm presenting this at, like, recon. It's just an ELF file, right? Like, I mean, that's basically just releasing source code. Um, like, you know, we have people hacking, like, spaceships and stuff. Like, I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, it's pretty readable code, really. I mean, pretty readable binary, like, once you decompile it. There's some, um, a few quirks here and there, but, um, yeah, not a whole lot more. There's no code obfuscation. That I could tell. I guess that's kind of a subjective call, but it doesn't look like it. Um, anyone else? Just start talking if your hand's up and I'm not seeing it. Okay, cool. I think it's time for the next talk. Uh, thanks for your uh, patience and attention.